Hello? All right. Should I stand up here? Should I stand down here? Stand up here? Okay. So as she said, I started out as, I'm a commercial photographer. As a commercial photographer, I moved into, because I did such large set production uh, photography, I started directing commercials all through the 90s and into today. I still direct and I DP direct. One day, one of my clients said to me, why don't you just take a little behind the scenes stuff of what you're doing and put it on YouTube and see what happens? And I said, okay, well, that's what we do. We direct, we had an editor. So we shot a piece, we cut it together, we put it on YouTube and it's like, it got thousands of views all of a sudden. So I started thinking, well, there's, some, there's something going on here. So this is what we started. First, I want to uh, thanks to Lassie, which has been such a fabulous. I've been using their rugged drives since they came out. I love them. I ran over with a car, literally, I have. And uh, they keep on working, they're fabulous. So I started this channel called The Slanted Lens, and this is just a little bit about The Slanted Lens. Hi, this is JP Morgan. Hi, this is JP Morgan. This is JP Morgan. Today on The Slanted Lens, we're here in New York City, and we're out on location at the Ultimate Graveyard. We're down here in Hollywood. Hey, JP, how are you? Good. We're now gonna talk about how light creates separation. And we're gonna take some fabulous vintage Hollywood portraits. Quick tip about the nuts and bolts of video photography. I'm gonna take a fancy portrait of a girl with fire in her hands, and this little girl with trees behind me. I'm ready for my close-up, Mr. DeMille. This ought to be really easy. You're flapping your jaw just a little bit too much. You should subscribe to The Slanted Lens. It may not save your life, but why risk it? So I'm gonna talk about the four pillars of a successful YouTube channel. It, for me, there are several things that are happening here. I love to do this because I get to do whatever I want to do, but I realized that as I did whatever I wanted to do, I started to separate myself a little bit from my audience, and, but at times I would bring my audience with me. So I'm gonna talk about what that means here. Number one, creating a brand. It really, in the end, is I worked in television, I did some television scripts, I talked to people about how to put TV shows together, and the number one thing everyone always said is, well, you can't have this weird show. Even Spielberg can't have a show that's about different people at different times. You gotta have a character, you gotta have a person that they like, you gotta have a person they relate to. Then pretty soon it doesn't matter what this person does, as long as you've got this person. Well, I became that person, I am the brand. I am too goofy sometimes, I know that. I am just, it's just who I am, but, uh, it's a constant question as to what I present myself as on this channel. It is a constant question for me. I do this, which is just, it's, and people are going, yeah, it's just goofy. And I am, I'm just goofy. There's no doubt about it. The Apple box thing I did was picked up by No Film School and all the different blogs and people loved it, but it's definitely goofy. I got all kinds of pushback on this because I'm destroying apples. Uh, Today on The Slant Lens, we're going to talk about apples! Full apples! Half apples! Quarter apples! And a pancake! Let's get started and see what we can do. Not those kinds of apples! These kinds of apples! Apple boxes! A buddy of mine pulled myself aside. He's done comedy for years and he said, you don't have to yell to make a point. <laughs> I said, well, that's good advice. I've tried to take that advice as I put it together. That's the side of JP that is out there and kind of goofy, and sponsors sometimes get a little scared of because it's a little over the top. But this is the side of me that's the more serious All side. All I have to do is to move the slide off from camera axis, and dimension starts to be created. As I move it around off from camera angle now, we've gone from zero to about 60 degrees. We now have five things that have happened. It's like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. For me, I love the comedy thing. I love to have comedy in the things that we do because I want people to enjoy it. I also like to teach principles. I want to teach principles that I feel like are just taught in a very simple way because I see things very simply. 
And so in that Hi, process, Today I try to have fun, and, and I've kind of found this middle ground where I see you, Johnny. it's a little higher Johnny, end comedy. It's fun. It's engaging, but we're still we're not over the top. But we're teaching and we're mentoring and we're doing those things on the channel. So that's the first one. You know, I use my logo on everything to brand this thing. Everything, everything we do, I try to keep the logo. In the beginning, I had this little boy on here, and pretty soon it morphed into my picture. And I have a hard time seeing my picture. I can't stand look at my my uh, videos. I put them up. I have to look at them when they edit them. I can't look at them again. I just can't do it. So it really is. It's interesting to me because I see some very successful YouTube people out there who have great personalities, have a great setup. It's less about what they know, and it's more about where they end up. I've been watching one gal for a while. She's very young, and she presents things about Photoshop and, and editing and things. And I look at this, and I'm going, oh, my word. It is just so backdoor, and it's like she truly doesn't know what she's doing, but she gets an incredible outcome, and she's fun to watch. And so the people are engaged. They're really engaged by that. They love the outcome. You don't have to be the world's foremost uh, you know, expert on a subject matter to have a really good following to get people to follow you. But you have to have a good outcome. You have to show stuff people want to see, and they're going to find engaging. I think having some expertise is really important, but it's not the most important thing. In the beginning, I used to do these things where I'd do all kinds of BTS. You know, we'd go out on set. I'm shooting all the time, so YouTube is not my full-time job. So I would have a person there that'd shoot all kinds of BTS. We would cut that together, and then I would quickly do a voiceover track, and we'd put those up on the channel. Those did okay, but when I finally started a more vlog, where I would just simply talk to the camera and teach the principles, the numbers went way, way up. It was, it was more engaging to the audience. The personality comes through. There, it's just a little more approachable. All right, number two, any questions on that? You're kind of the number one principle, and that is gaining your point of view and who you are. Any thoughts, any questions? All right, I'm going to go on. I cannot emphasize, if you want followers on YouTube and you want a channel to grow, if you post once a week and then a month later you post again and then a, a month later you do three, you will never grow on YouTube. Consistency, consistency, consistency. We posted every Thursday every first and second Thursday for the first two years at 3 o'clock. We moved that to every Thursday at 3 o'clock. We now move, we post it every Tuesday and Thursday at 3 o'clock. It, it, it just drives me nuts. It, if at 3.08, the video is not up. It drives me crazy. I want it to be up and playing by 3 o'clock. I want to be answering comments because I want people know first to be on. You know, I want to be able to answer those comments between 3 and 3.15, 3.20. That's kind of my live time. When I'm trying to be on there, I want somebody to be there to engage and to be able to answer questions so people know that someone is there, there's somebody out there to take care of them. And so be consistent. I've found that you've got to learn to start. If you want your followers to grow and you want this audience to build, you've got to start to respond to what they like. Uh, I didn't do camera reviews in the beginning. I didn't love doing camera reviews. Uh, we did a couple of them, and all of a sudden it's huge, you know, and people are loving and responding to that, so we're doing more camera reviews. I went back and looked at my most, mo most views videos. I do that every month. What's the most viewed videos this month? And I look at what am I doing in those? What am I saying? What are the principles I'm teaching? I take that information, I try to wrap it into what I'm doing next to be able to do the next videos because the audience is telling me something. People vote with their feet. They're either there or they leave. You know, So if they're not there, why are they not there? What are, are the videos that cause them to be there? So I look at those videos and I start making decisions. I've got to do this and this to keep my audience with me. This is what I love. If I could spend the rest of my life just going around shooting vintage images, that's what I would do. I did a bunch of this for the channel. People like it. But if that's all I did, I would lose my audience. I would lose them immediately. But I do some of this kind of vintage stuff, which is just what I love. But I really have gone more into camera reviews. I've gone into more teaching things about light, always trying different things. I'm about to do a series on the very, ba very, very, very basics of photography, like what's an aperture. Uh, basically, because my daughter said to me, Dad, you never taught me how to use a camera. And I'm going, well, I'll teach you on YouTube. How about that? <laughs> As if, if a child doesn't learn how to learn, use a camera, somehow I'm a bad father, I guess. <laughs> so I will note that if you're in the industry. Okay. You cannot, you cannot connect with people on social media enough. I get emails. I answer every email anyone ever sends me. I get questions on Facebook. I don't answer them. I'm on, I have a gal who's answering things on Facebook, but she sends them to me. This morning I got a whole list to answer these questions. I can't answer them. 
I answer them and send them back. But if anyone emails me directly, I email them back. I get on the YouTube channel, try to answer questions at least once a day for people who have different questions on there. That kind of social engagements, it really, it really brings a sense of community uh, on, the, uh, on the channel. You can't invite people enough. Every time I say, join the, the Slanted Lens business group or join the Slanted Lens Facebook group, the numbers go right up. I mean, it's just as if people don't really know what to do until you tell them. You have to keep telling them what to do. I do these really stupid things. Make sure you join our Facebook group where you can see other exciting things like this. Subscribe to the Slanted Lens or I'll send a JP over. I'll send this little bundle of joy to live with you. It's just weird stuff. I know, you saw this one. The other. You should subscribe to the Slanted Lens. It may not save your life, but why risk it? Just push that button right there. So I'm doing those kinds of calls to action all the time. I, and sometimes I feel like I'm doing them too much, but we do two or three of them in every video. You know, so make sure you subscribe. You know, I'll go through your, your mom subscribed, your grandma subscribed. How come your grandpa subscribed and you haven't? I just do a lot of that kind of weird stuff. So it kind of helps pe keep people engaged and get them in involved there. This is the most important one for me, monetization. I'm not doing this just because I'm a benevolent guy. I'd like to say I am. But, uh, and I do enjoy that about it. I absolutely enjoy the fact that I can help people and have an experience with them that helps them to grow in, the, in the, this industry. But in the end, it has to be supported financially or I can't make this a business. So the first thing is we get clicks through YouTube. Now, that is not that much money. I mean, we get like 500 to 600,000 views a month on the Slanted Lens on the YouTube channel. And that only transfers into about eight or $900 in revenue, ad revenues which is not a huge number. I mean, you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's a lot of money. Well, no, it's not a lot of money. <laughs> that is not a lot of money. So that becomes just kind of, that's just uh, found money at this point for us. It's not what we base everything on. We really look to find sponsors, people who will sponsor us like Lassie, you know, that will come in and that they have a great product, something that I believe in, that I feel like I can show. And I want them to become a, a, a paying partner to the slanted lens. That's how we monetize it. And then I show in my videos a clip of their product being used as often as I possibly can. I want to see their product in use. I want them to, and there's different sponsors at different levels. I have gold sponsors that they get to, in all of our videos. I have silver sponsors that are only in a certain number. Then I make videos about their product. I, I call them teaching videos. And that is like, like we've done one on our storage process at home, what we do to back everything up. That was what we've done for Lassie. And so that becomes a way that we kind of gain this partnership with each other where they're gaining value. I'm showing content that kind of teaches about their product in the use, uh, in the process of being used in the industry. So sponsors is a great way to do this. It's a constant process. I, building a mailing list is probably the most important thing. I realized today in some conversations I had with some people on some things we're going to do in the future is that the value that I have in having a YouTube channel is not just that I have a YouTube channel. It's that I have access to a group of people and that I can reach out to them, and in that process, I can either show them a product that may be interesting to them, I can show them another, uh, something of value. Uh, one gal I'm working with, Trisha Zamp, does stop motion stuff. She goes, I really want to do stop motion children's books. So through our channel, we will show the making of, and then she's going to sell her stop motion children's books uh, to people on the channel. It's a matter of gaining an audience and using that audience to grow and to, to be able to sell products. Doing a process now with a, another company where we're going to blend, we're doing giveaways, which we used to do giveaways for free. We've done it for free for years. And he has a thing where, where he sets up where people refer and do all kinds of things. And he's getting eight and 10,000 new emails when he does a giveaway. But then he charges people to be involved to do that giveaway. And it's very successful. And, it's become a, and we're going to be starting doing, doing these on the slanted lens here starting in June. So another way to monetize. I realize that every time, it's interesting, the industry always changes, and it does scare me. Every time I hear that YouTube is, you know, anytime I hear something about YouTube's gonna do this or that, it kind of makes me go, oh, you know, what are they gonna do now? You know, but in the end, I've got an audience of people there. If I have to kind of tweak how we get to them and how we reach them and how we get the money back from them, then I'll do it. Part of the way I can monetize this is because I am not, this is not what I do every day. I was on, I shot three commercials last week. I had a person there shooting BTS in every one of them, and I make myself, and as hard as it is, day's done, I'm going, okay, I'm gonna do an opener for this, a closer for that, I'm gonna talk about this, I'm gonna talk about these principles, and I try to put these lessons together when we're there, after the client leaves, 
And I tell the clients ahead of time, going, look, this is for a great client called Zuma Juice. They're going, we love it if you put these up on our channel. It's like free advertising for us. So I credit them, I put their logo on there, I give them, make them a part of that experience. And in that, they get value as well. So now I can take a day that I'm already working, content that I'm already creating, and by just simply adding a BTS person to do some video and making myself stay a little later, I can put together two or three lessons from that experience that helps the client. Trisha Zemp says to me, well, why don't you monetize that? Like, this is a day shooting, but if you pay us an extra $2,500, we will now put your video up as a YouTube video and we'll start pushing to our, towards your client, which is really a great idea um, and something maybe uh, we will talk about. All right. We, everything we do is about building the audience, monetizing through sponsors, and then selling downloads. We have a place where we have at the back where we have different uh, kinds of downloads on doing video, on doing business. My favorite is a business class. It's a curriculum I put together after teaching at a university for three semesters. And it's a 16-week uh, curriculum on doing business. I love that business class. I meet with them live uh, once a month for those who have purchased this class. And that becomes a labor of love for me because I, for the price they pay is like $280. Perpetually for the, ne you know, the next 10 years, I'll meet with this group live for an hour and a half and answer everybody's questions. And I just, I love seeing people grow. I think the biggest, the biggest kind of shortfall in the creative industry is that people don't know anything about business. And the biggest obstacle to overcome is they don't want to know anything about business. <laughs> It's like, oh, please don't teach me something about business. I might have to do it, you know? <laughs> so it's like, I just love people that will engage with that and, uh, and be able to have that experience with them. I do teaching lessons where I'll take a product and if I, a client says, I have this great product, I'll take it and do it in the context of, this is how you use it in the industry. I don't say this is a product you should buy. I show how I use it, how we would apply it, and how that applies to the industry. That becomes a very easy sell for people. They're going, oh, this is fabulous. You know, this is something I can see how I use. I had the experience this last week, and it was a little scary to me. I was on set with a guy, and he brought out his camera gear. Uh, he had been hired, not through me, but he brings out his camera gear, and I'm going, wow, this is the same camera bag I have. He goes, yeah. And he opens it up, and I'm going, you have all the same camera lenses I have. He goes, yeah, yeah, I do. And he pulls out his tripod. You've got the Vanguard tripod I've got. I'm going, dude, you have everything that I have. He goes, yes, I follow your YouTube channel. I own every product that you show, every one of them. I'm going... <laughs> I'm going, I'm not sure whether to be freaked out or to be uh, complimented here. I don't know. But you know what? I realize, and it is hard sometimes for sponsors to, to understand that though people may not click at the end of the video and go to B&H and buy their bag, they will certainly, they start to, to find these products and they may go to B&H next week or in some way they mentor. I do it too. When I see that Lars has got something, this is Lars Lindstrom that works with me on the Slanted Lens. When I see that Lars has got something and he says this works, I buy it. I mean, because I trust Lars. I know that he's, you know, I know that he knows what he's doing. And so when he gives me that recommendation, I'm in. So people see you in that way. And I think that's what's really positive for sponsors. Okay. We've been doing webinars as part of this growing process to gain our audience, to be able to monetize. We're going to do more lighting webinars this next week. Photo tours. I'm going to Cuba in January, February next year. It'll be the second time in Cuba. And I've already got 30-plus people on that list that want to go. Uh, so if you want to go to Cuba with the Slanted Lens, send an email to Judy at the Slanted Lens and get on that list because we'll have a great time. We'll spend 10 days in, in uh, Cuba uh, shooting at some fabulous places. Okay. Talked about all that. Okay. Any questions on gaining an audience? Any questions up to this point before I talk about gear really fast? I'm about done. No questions? You guys are great. <laughs> okay, I've, I tried to, tried to boil this down for this presentation that if I had to do this, very, very simple, and this probably isn't super simple, but for me it feels simple, I think this is just a basic setup for me. If I have an A7R2 or an A7S or the 6500, I love this Sony platform for a couple reasons. I like 4K for a couple reasons because I can set one camera on me and I can punch in and out of that in the editing, and it's like having two cameras. Now I don't have to set up two cameras. Now this is run and gun stuff. This is very, very simple run and gun stuff. So I use Metabones because all my lenses are EF mount lenses. I use Tamron lenses, and that 2470 is a fabulous lens just to give me what I need 
uh, for this kind of, this, like I say, this is just a simple setup. If I travel, and Jolene and I travel, a lot of times Jolene becomes a camera person for me, my wife. She is the furthest, from it. she does not like it, she doesn't want to do it, but she's there. So I want a setup that I can put up, it's really simple to use, and she can run. And then I use this, it's the XLR uh, K2M. The K2M is just an XLR, two inputs, so I can run two lobs into it. Runs right back to the Sony, so it lays the sound right back onto the, to the clip. It's just a simple setup. I'm done. I hand the clip, you know, when I download the stuff onto my Let's See drive, I get back to the shop, it's all ready to go, it's ready to edit. We've used Zoom recorders, and I love Zoom recorders, but it's just another step, another piece of equipment, you know, something else I have to haul along with me. In saying that, I'm like, I think it was Winston Churchill that said, uh, every good photographer wears uh, suspenders and a belt. So in saying that, I always take the Zoom recorder, <laughs> and I always have a lot, I usually put something else on that just as a backup. But in, the, in this, so I use two lobs, Sennhauser lobs. I say the Zoom recorders are very simple, and a laptop. That is a on-the-go uh, production for me in the, in, the, in the field, and it's very, very simple. I have everything I need. I can edit on the laptop. I can put stuff on my LaCie drives when I'm done. I've got everything there. So it's just a really simple vlogging for me. Now, there are much simpler cameras out there, the GH5, the GH4. Uh, a lot of those products, there's some Fuji cameras that are even smaller. You, there are some small platforms out there that will work very similar. But I do love the, the audio solution that you have with the Sony, and that makes that a, a winner for me. It really does. When I, I am not a camera, I have Canons, I have Sonys, I have, I have a lot of different platforms. So for me, it's like whatever camera works for what we have to do, and that's kind of where it's at. Any questions on that equipment solution? You can get all of these things at, at B&H or our uh, affiliate link. I'm saying that for you, Stuart. <laughs> I, I tell everybody, you know what? If you're going to buy something, buy it through the sun lens. Keep Lars and I uh, uh, off the streets. <laughs> so, so there you go. Any questions? Yes. Can you repeat the question? Yes, I will. He's asking if I use the closed caption feature on YouTube. We transcribed all of our lessons and put them on that closed caption so that they're there. It, it's all, there's a translation there, English translation and everything. My next step is, and I've, I've talked to several vloggers and, and uh, people, YouTube channel owners, they said, look, take your entire uh, library, translate it into Spanish, get someone to do the Spanish and get it out there. He said, you'll double your audience. And that's our next step.